Hello everyone, my name is Ryan Eborn and I am here today on behalf of the marketing team with School Health. I'd like to thank you for joining us today and participating in our hearing screening webinar. In today's webinar, Dr. Carrie Browning will help you increase your knowledge of hearing screening, including talking about best practices that will support you as you work to identify more children in need of intervention. Before I turn the time over to Dr. Browning, I would like to review a few quick things about today's webinar. We will not be taking audio questions during the webinar, but you can submit your questions through the questions interface in GoToWebinar. Feel free to submit your questions anytime during the presentation. Uh, Dr. Browning is going to take about 45 minutes with her presentation, and after that, uh, we will begin to answer the questions in the order in which they were received. I um, also wanted to let everybody know sometimes we, we get into a situation where we don't uh, get to every question. If we don't happen to answer your question, we will reach out to you directly with an answer after the webinar is over. Uh, we are recording this webinar, and within the coming days, you will receive an email with a link to this recorded presentation. Uh, on that email will also be a certificate of attendance. Um, everyone who attends today will be uh, able to take the certificate of attendance and present it to your governing body uh, for potential CEU credits, depending on how your organizations uh, take care of those things. Um, but just keep an eye out on your email box for the link for the recorded presentation and for your certificate uh, that will be coming in the following days. Um, lastly, if you're having technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, please call GoToWebinar directly and let me give you their number. It is 855-352-9003. Again, that number for GoToWebinar is 855-352-9003. And now we will turn the time over to Dr. Browning. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you everyone for participating in this webinar. Today, I will talk about hearing screenings with a focus specifically on peer tone and OAE screenings. Um, so just to give you some basic uh, overview of what we, what we want to discuss today is that we'll have a little brief uh, section on basic anatomy, I want to discuss the incidence of hearing loss, both hearing screenings that are being conducted in schools, as well as hearing screening preparation, and then specifically focusing on the peer tone hearing screenings and OAE hearing screenings. Just for a basic anatomy, just to give you a little bit of an overview, we have our hearing pathway here. And the first thing that we want to focus on is this outer ear. There are three main portions to the hearing pathway that I, I will be discussing. And like I said, this is the first, the outer ear. This consists of that visual portion of the ear called the pinna and also the ear canal. The outer ear does end at the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. The second section is the middle ear. This does consist of that tympanic membrane as well, and then the three smallest bones in the ear, which are the incus, the malleus, and the stapes. The middle ear is an air-filled cavity where, and this is where the eustachian tube actually um, um, has a, uh, is connected. And the reason I bring this up is because this is where how we equalize that pressure in that middle ear so that when we are changing in altitude levels, then you will hear our ears pop. But also this, this area, because it's that air-filled space, this is where kids will develop some ear infections or fluid, and that's where that's collected. The third section um, that I'll discuss is the inner ear. This consists of the cochlea. That's that snail-shaped um, structure that you can see right there. Um, also, the auditory nerve is, uh, is, is included in this. So what happens is when that sound pressure is directed into the ear, um, it actually turns into an electrochemical impulse once it reaches this cochlea, or the organ of hearing. From there, that auditory nerve then sends that response up to the brain via that auditory nerve, and this is where we get that cognitive com uh, component of hearing once it reaches the brain. 
What about the prevalence of hearing loss in children? This is a very well researched um, uh, issue because there are, we know that hearing loss is the number one birth defect in the US. We know that one in three babies out of a thousand um, at birth do have hearing loss. And that we also know that there's an increase in hearing loss throughout the childhood years, that it's not specific to only at birth, that hearing loss can develop later on as well. And that's why it's very important to be having these, these children tested. Uh, also, we know that there, when we're talking about hearing loss, we can have a permanent hearing loss as well as fluctuating hearing loss. Fluctuating hearing loss, as I mentioned, with that middle ear having that fluid in there, that would be a fluctuating hearing loss because once that fluid is, is gone, then that child should hear normally again. But because of, we have this comparison of permanent and, and fluctuating hearing loss, we know that this can impact one out of seven school-aged children. So it's a, it's a pretty big deal that we want to make sure that these kids are being assisted and these hearing loss is being addressed. Also, we know that high frequency is becoming more of, a, of, a, of a, a problem within our adolescents. We know that one in six um, adolescents have, can have high frequency hearing loss. This is often related to hazardous noise. And we know that um, with the increase of earbud use, that's a concern for us that more and more kids are developing a high frequency hearing loss. Um, as far as the consequences of undiagnosed hearing loss, uh, we know that with, with children, with infants, with, that there's a huge language and cognitive, cognitive component, meaning there will certainly have delays in their language and cognitive development if they have a hearing loss. Uh, we also know that social development, you know, with kids that aren't being able to hear, they're not going to, you know, work, have this relationship with their peers as easily. There can certainly be social withdrawal, depression, decrease, decrease in quality of life for kids, but also adults that have hearing loss. And also we know that there's a financial impact uh, with hearing loss, that when individuals have entered that workforce, they usually have lower wages, and that can result in um, a cost to the American economy of over $150 billion. Also with, with children having hearing loss, this can affect the individual and standardized school test scores. So that's why it is really important for these children to be identified and provided the medical and educational assistance that's necessary. So um, the hearing screenings in schools, there is no specific federal mandate for, for children in hearing screenings, but there is some federal legislation to identify children with hearing loss. So working in the schools, you are well aware of these acts or standards that are in place. I've listed them here just to have, you know, have it listed for you so you have it all in one place. Um, but we do know the Individuals with Disability Education Act that this does require school districts to identify and evaluate all children with disabilities, but also require a child fine system to identify infants and toddlers needing services. Also with the Head Start programs, they need to conduct their hearing screenings within a 45 day of enrollment, and they also need to pro provide future hearing screenings when needed. And lastly, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services are saying there is definitely a need to identify these teens with high frequency hearing loss due to this increase that we're noticing. So why are he hearing screenings so important in the schools? Well, we know that healthy vision and hearing are critical to a child's growth, but also the child's success in schools is, is, is very important with these two, with these two sensories. Uh, so having vision and hearing problems identified and caught early, that means treatment can be provided and caught early, and that the child doesn't get too far behind in the school. We know that even a mild hearing loss can greatly impact a child's ability to develop speech and language. So it is important to really help them along very early on. Also, it's important to note that even though we have well child uh, visits within pediatric offices, we also know that children are maybe not are going to fewer than their visits than what is recommended by the AAP. And so because we have the school, we have these children in the schools, these screenings already in place, this is a, a way for us to identify and provide the assistance needed to these children.
So just to briefly go over some hearing screening recommendations. With hearing screenings, they are incorporated by the local and state educational jurisdictions, and it's been in place for decades. Um, but there's some, there can be significant differences from one authority to the other. And so that's why I can't give you uh, a protocol that, every, that is in place for everyone. What I have done is I've just given you an example. So here I have listed the Minnesota Department of Health, their screening recommendation um, for our state. I'm actually in Minnesota. So for Minnesota, uh, this is what they recommend. They recommend that you use an OAE, an autoacoustic emissions device, for those kids that are zero to three years of age. They also say that if an, a child is unable, if, if the child is older than that, but is unable to be screened by pure tone audiometry, then certainly incorporate OAE for that child as well. They also specify within their standard that 4,000 hertz is a mandatory passing frequency. So that might be a, 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 an exception to, to Minnesota, but those are things that you wanna look at when you're looking at your hearing screening recommendations from the state. The, another, uh, for pure tone audiometry, they're recommending that this is conducted on children three years and older. They are recommending that this uh, in, should be tested or screened from kindergarten through third grade, but also the addition of fifth, eighth, and 11th grade as well. And their recommendation for the frequencies that are tested as well as the level is that 500 hertz, when I'm using my pure tone audiometer and I'm testing at 500 hertz, I need my screening level to be at 25 dB. But at one, two, and 4,000 hertz, 20 dB is the screening level. So that's what the child has to respond to. It's important to also note that in October 2017, uh, the Minnesota Department of Health added 6,000 hertz for children ages 11 and up. And that's because of that high frequency incidence that we're seeing. So it's important to kind of review your standards periodically um, for the hearing screening program to see if there's any changes that you need to take into account for your, for your uh, school. One other thing that's, that, that is specific to Minnesota, and I don't know how, how um, this is all around the country, but they do recommend that tympanometry also be used in, conju in conjunction with OAE and pure tone audiometry when a refer result is, when a refer result is, um, is shown. So that's something to take, and I'll talk a little bit about tympanometry, what that test is and what it does, but just keep in mind some of, some of these things as you're looking at your state protocol. As we're looking at the difference between screening versus diagnostic and what needs to be com completed in the school is that the screening is a pass and refer result only. It's a simple test that is only checking to see does the child hear or is there something that I need to have the child go on for further testing. It does not diagnose. It just is saying, okay, when do, when do I need to refer this child on? Also, this test, screening test can be completed by a school nurse, it can be completed by a trained technician, it also can be completed by a trained adult. So, so there's a variety of people that can perform the screening test within your school. But when it comes to diagnostics, this diagnostic hearing testing is a detailed evaluation. This is telling the, trying to determine the type and degree of hearing loss. This is completed by an audiologist, and it, it will determine is there further medical attention required. And that further medical attention could be this, this child needs to be seen by an ENT or their physician, their pediatrician, or maybe this child is a candidate for hearing aids. So that's what will be determined between the audiologist and their uh, physician on future care. Now I'd like to go through the screening preparation. So there's just kind of some things that you want to have in place before you can actually start screening. The first thing is that you want to, in your screening preparation, you need to determine what is the best test, test method. So what is going to be the test methods that you're going to have in your, in your school? That's going to be determined by the recommendations from the state. That's going to also be determined by the age of the of children that you're, you're working with. So we'll just review each of these different test methods, methods so that you can evaluate what is, what's going to work for you. The first test, test method is audiometry. So with audiometry, I'm using an audiometer. It's a pure tone. This is that pure tone audiometry test where the uh, tone is presented, the child needs to respond. You're placing headphones over their ear. 
And this test, because I'm evaluating from that ear canal with those headphones, going through that middle ear space, eventually to the cochlea, the nerve, and then to the brain, this is a test of that entire system. The child not only needs to hear, but they need to respond. It's a cognitive type of response. They need to tell you that they heard that sound. So this is a subjective test. This is where you need to get a response from the, from the child. It is recommended that this test, as I mentioned earlier, is for three years and above. And the, and the equipment is that audiometer. And when you're looking at audiometers, there's many audiometers out there, but for the purposes of school screenings, an air-only audiometer is important. The second test method that I'm gonna go through is the tympanometry. So this is where I'm going to use a tympanometer. I put a probe in the ear. There's a picture there that you can see where a probe is placed into that, into that ear. And what happens is there's some pressure, there's some air that's put into, into that ear canal. And what I'm trying to determine is how is that eardrum moving? So it's evaluating the middle ear up to the middle ear system, because I wanna see how that eardrum is moving or if it's not moving. This is an objective test because the child does not have to do any type of response to you. The, the device is going to perform and, and display the results for you. Um, so the child doesn't have to do anything. But it's important to remember that tympanometry is not a hearing test. It is used in conjunction, conjunction with your screening equipment to just give you more information, maybe what's happening with this particular child. And this test can be used from birth on. So this can be used for all of your, your the, ch the children population that you serve. Um, as far as autoacoustic emissions is concerned, autoacoustic emissions is another objective test where there is no response required from the child. That's why it's a, it's a recommended method for that zero to three years of age. Um, also, just keep in mind that with OAEs for those special needs, maybe English is a second language that you just can't get the instruction to them, then this also would be a, a, a good test to have available to test the, that particular population. You will need an autoacoustic emissions device. And as, this is evaluating up to the cochlea. So what, and I'll go ex explain what autoacoustic auto emissions is next. But this is taking it from that ear canal by placing that probe in the ear. The sound has to travel up to the cochlea. So this is, this is that stopping point of autoacoustic emissions. So I just want to give you a brief overview of what autoacoustic auto emissions is. Um, so if you look at that image below, you can see the probe is in the ear. There's that green line that goes, goes to that cochlea. And then there's a dotted arrow that's coming back. So what's happening is the probe is distributing some low-level sounds into that ear canal. It's traveling through the, the hearing system, and it's what the, the tones, when it gets to the cochlea, the cochlea actually sends a response back out of the ear canal. So there's a, a tone that's actually being generated by the cochlea. So that's what's happening. Sounds are coming in, and there's a specific sound that we're looking for to come back out. There can be two types of, of OAE stimuli, there can be a distortion product or a transient. And the difference between that is only the, the stimulus that's being used. A distortion product uses two tones um, that's being presented into the cochlea, where, where transient is using a click. We are find that in screening uh, situations, distortion product is the primary method that's being used. Um, so I have a picture over here on the, on the, on the right-hand side of what, that, what those um, outer hair cells look like. So if we had a really healthy cochlea, the outer hair cells are all there, that top image is what you would expect to see. But if there's damage to those, organ, those outer hair cells, that bottom image is showing you some damaged outer hair cells. So if I don't have outer hair cells in my cochlea, it's gonna be really challenging to, to be able for them to accept that response and, and send that signal back. So that's where we would have these reverse scenarios occur. Um, as far as for screening programs, it is, it is a very, very practical screening um, test tool because it allows you to test those children that just cannot do that peer tone audiometry. But there are a couple of limitations that you need to be aware of. One of them is that OAEs may not detect a mild hearing loss. 
So that's why you know, we want to always use that gold standard of the pure tone audiometry when we can, so that we can make sure we're, not, we're getting that signal all the way up and getting that cognitive response. And then also, OAEs would not detect an auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. And what that is is that after the cochlea, maybe the nerve or something is damaged, and, and so we, because we're not doing that in full cognitive path, we would not be able to detect that type of disorder. Another thing to know with OAEs is because that signal has to travel through that ear canal, the middle ear system, and the cochlea, if there's something happening in that middle ear space, it's going to be very hard for that, those signals to be accepted by the cochlea and heard or responded to, and then also having that signal being sent back. So you can see here on the image there, if I have fluid in that middle ear space, I kind of get my signal blocked that's being presented into the, toe, into the um, ear canal. So that's where tympanometry is really important to understand and to know within your screening practice, because then I can evaluate. If I get a refer, one of the first things that I may want to do is do tympanometry to see, well, maybe it's, maybe it's the, the eardrum isn't moving like it should. It, maybe it's, so I can just give me more information as I'm going through my screening protocol. As far as a, another aspect of screening preparation is your equipment check. So we need to make sure that that equipment is working appropriately on our screening day. So one way is that we do need to have those devices calibrated yearly. So just as on an overall yearly basis, have your device calibrated. That's our recommendation from the manufacturer. But also on the screening day, I need to do a, a daily self-listening check. And that is because I don't want to go through all of my screenings, maybe start referring people when it could be an equipment malfunction. So that's the importance of, of doing this on your screening days. How do you do that? Well, what you do is you're going to just review your overall device. I want to look at the accessories that I have. I want to look at the cords. I want to look at the jacks, at that headband, at the ear cushions, and making sure that they all look appropriate, that there's not cracks in them, that type of thing. There's not maybe some some corrosion or something, on, maybe on the jack. So just review those, review those accessories. Then would you want to make sure you plug in the, if everything should be plugged in, but if not, plug it in before you turn on the device. And then you're going to place those headphones on your ears. You're going to test your, your, use your test signal, which could be a steady tone, a pulse tone, or a warble tone based off of the equipment that you're using. You're going to set the level of that or the volume of that audiometer to a pretty low level, which is 10 to 20 dB. And then you're just going to start presenting tones at different frequencies, and you're going to be listening for any crackling sounds, maybe some absence sounds when I should expect to hear it, just any unexpected tones, because when I present the tone, that's what I should be hearing. I shouldn't be hearing any distortion or anything like that in that transducer. So you're just going to be going through all of the different frequencies, both the right and the left ear, and just listening to those sounds. And the last thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to turn on a tone continuously, and you're going to want to just move the cords. Because what happens is, as I'm moving the cords and I'm presenting a, town, a, a tone, um, sometimes I may hear some crackling or a sound break or some distortion. And we know that kids don't sit still. So during your test method, they're going to be moving around. And when they do, you want to make sure that that, that movement is not going to impact your screening. Of course, with our test pre screening preparation, we need to make sure that we have all the supplies on hand. So you're going to collect the accessories before that screening day uh, comes around. And here's a list of some of those accessories that you may need to purchase or, or have. One is for the sanitizing wipes. You're going to want to make sure that you're cleaning those headphones, the, the, um, the cushions, and that type of thing from child to child. You're also going to want some probe tubes or tips, um, depending upon how the, the term is used by each manufacturer, but for OAEs. So when you have an OAE device, you're going to have this probe tube at the end, and you're going to want to make sure that you have a few on hand, depending upon the device, because if that gets blocked or plugged, I don't want to have to stop my screening for that day if it's just a matter of being able to replace that. Some devices will have um, ones that are replaced frequently, and other, other devices may have ones where you may not have to replace it as frequently or, or you don't get as many when you, when you order them. But just look at your product, make sure you have the, the appropriate equipment so that when something like that happens, that it's just a blockage in that probe tip, that you can continue on, replace it and continue on. 
Another thing is if you are using OAE and tympanometry, that you're going to want to have your selection of ear tips available. So make sure that I have enough ear tips for the children that I'm testing for that screening program. Also, you need to have your documentation forms and pens available. You might want to have some stickers or some other type of giveaways for the child once they complete that screening. And then, of course, your class list. But what about the, where the screening should occur? So what's, where's the location in the, in the school that I should conduct the screening? That's an important aspect of the screening program. So as, you're, as you are the screener, you wanna just make sure that you're aware of any noise levels, either on when I'm conducting my testing or when I'm choosing the location. So when I'm conducting my testing, I wanna make sure that talking, paper sh shuffling, movements of the desks and furnitures are kept to a minimum. So just be aware of those noises that are occurring during the testing process. But before even that, we need to find the correct location in the school that I can conduct the screening. So looking at this list here, we know we don't want to be in high, in high traffic areas, probably not going to want to be, you know, by where the playground is or the, the lunch room, that type of thing. So just look at the overall um, location of your screening and keep these things in mind as you're selecting. And also, um, are there busier, of times in the area that you're screening. So if I'm in the library, but the but I know that at lunch there's constant um, noise, I want to make sure that I'm not performing screenings when that that action is happening, when those kids are moving in the hallways, um, or you just kind of delay your testing or try to reroute that um, movement of the kids when when it's appropriate. Another thing when you're looking at your location is you want to make sure that your the area or the room is uncluttered and free of visual distraction. So we want that child to really focus on the screening when they're there. So make sure that you're not by any windows or open doors where they're watching kids on the playground rather than focusing on the, the testing that's occurring. Also avoid any mirrors or other reflective surfaces because if there's a you know kids in the background moving and that type of thing, we don't want their attention to be to be um, broke as they're performing that, the test. One thing that you can do when you're looking at your locations is you can monitor the noise levels, and there's a couple of ways to do that. You can use your sound, you can purchase and have a sound level meter. A sound level meter uh, can be an actual device, but they also actually have them on as an app now. So that's something that you can download. It is recommended that if you are going to be using a sound level meter, at least at the initial time, is get some get an audiologist to come in and do some training and make sure that you're understanding and knowing what that device is telling you. Because we want to make sure that the ambient noise does not exceed 50, 58, and 76 dB SPL, respective to 1, 2, and 4. So we want to make sure that your, your sound level meter has the capability of doing those measurements and that you're able to read those measurements. So it might be a good idea just to have an audiologist or someone come in and, and help you with that. Another is you can, if you don't want to go the sound level meter route, is that you can perform environmental noise level checks. And that's with your audiometer. How that works is you're going to take your audiometer, you're going to test someone with normal hearing, you're going to perform the frequencies that you would normally test, but you would, would require that person to respond 10 dB lower than your screening level. So if my screening level is 20 dB at 1, 2, and 4, I'm going to make sure that that person can hear that, that tone at 10 dB. So one, one or the other method is recommended. Another way for screening preparation is maybe giving some instruction in a group or an individual setting. So um, this obviously is age specific, but one of the ways to kind of speed up your testing time is that you can go into the classrooms that are going to be tested and explain exactly what's going to be happening so that the children know, they know how to respond, they're not worried or apprehensive about the screening, you know, so they can, they can visually see what's happening. Um, also, when you're in there, you can explain to them how it's it's really important to be quiet when the other, when their peers, when their friends are getting getting screened. So that making sure that they have some act, quiet activity as they're sitting and waiting patiently for their turn, just to explain that to them. Also, it would be it, be, it would be a good idea to you know, do a sample screening to gain their cooperation. So if they're not quite sure what's going to be happening, if you can show them what's going to be happening with someone, then you know that might ease their concerns. 
Also, it might it'd be a really good idea to perform that on someone that's uh, the child that's very cooperative. So choose your child um, specifically for you know that they're going to be able to do a great job when I'm showing this to the child. You know, even with OAE, showing exactly what's going to happen with an OAE device so that they, they see it, they see it that it's not going to hurt, and they can proceed on. As we're starting the screening process, so we're, we're stepping now into actually performing the screenings, um, but this visual inspection of the ear actually is applicable to both peer tone and to OAE, so I put it here. So when I'm, before I can screen an individual child, this is when I need to do a visual inspection. Um, it's completed before I even start the test, before I can put any headphones or the probe into the ear, because I need to inspect that outer ear, that ear canal, to make sure that there's no abnormalities. Um, I need to make sure that there's not any blockage or drainage or anything like that from, from the ear. If you're, you're smelling some, a foul smell, then you're not going to want to proceed on that particular child. You're going to want to refer them to um, a medical personnel. But um, specifically, when you're looking at that visual inspection, you're going to be pulling back and up on their, on their uh, pinna and their ear so that you can kind of really see that ear canal. This is really important specifically for OAEs. Um, so that you can note the ear tip size that you're going to need for that particular child. Now let's move on to specifically the peer tone hearing screening. So how do I, how do I conduct that? Um, with peer tone hearing screenings, um, what, the first thing that you want to do, you've already done that general instruction to the child, to the, to the group, but when they come down, you're probably going to have to repeat a few things or just give them some basics. So explain what's going to happen, that you're going to be hearing some tones. When you hear those tones, I need you to raise your hand nice and high for me. When that, um, it doesn't matter which ear you hear it in. And also just remind them that those sounds can be really, really quiet. So they have to listen really hard for that, for that beep. And then when they do, just raise, raise your hand for me. Then what you're going to do is you're going to, you know, move, move, remove any glasses and get the hair out of the way and then place the headphones on the child, making sure to put the red uh, phone on the right ear, the blue phone on the left ear. Um, you also are going to, before you start, you're going to confirm how my audiometer is set up, what test frequency I have, what frequency I have, what test ear is going to present, the, the signal is going to be presented in, the volume that I'm going to present that signal at, at so that's the first thing, making sure my audiometer is set up for that particular child. Uh, also, then you're, you might want to condition them at a higher volume because especially those small kids and because that sound can be very, very quiet to them, you're going to want to make sure that they truly know what they're listening for. So sometimes you might rather, if my screening level is 20 dB, I might start at you know, 40 or 50 dB and present the tone to them just so that they know what it, truly they are supposed to be listening for. So I'll present the tone at 50 dB, they respond. I go down to 40 dB, they respond. And I can go down in, in jumps in either 10, maybe 15, it just depends on what your screening level is and where you start. But eventually then you're going to get to your screening volume. And once I'm at my screening volume and they've responded, I remain at that screening volume throughout the test. I don't go back up, I don't need to go down for sure, but you stay at that screening level for all of the frequencies for that particular ear. And you can, that will make your test very, very quick. I'm at my level, I just need to change the frequencies, and I need to present the tone. One of the things to remember though, is you, you do want to present that tone more than once, because you want to make sure that it's a, it's a valid response. So it, it is recommended that you present at least two times, but no more than four. So you need to have them respond at least two times out of the four, or at least or half. Once I've completed one ear, then I'm going to switch to that next ear and I'm going to continue that same process. Now, when I switch the ears, I certainly could recondition them again by presenting that higher volume, making sure that they understand, okay, we're moving over to your left ear. This is what you need to respond to. You don't have to. You could stay at that screening level and just move quickly from one ear to the next. But if you're feeling that that child needs a little bit more help or, or they need a little bit more assistance, then certainly you can recondition at that on that other ear again. Now these, this is, because every state has some differences, this is just a, a sample screening process, but you wanna look at your state standards, your protocol, and make sure that you're following any specific um, protocol that they have in place. Sometimes they may say you have to go in a certain frequency order. 
So those are just all things that need to be verified within your state. Once I've conducted my peer tone screening, I have my results and I need to have those documented. So if I have a pass result, what that means is that all tones at screening levels in both ears have passed. So you can see a sample here on the left ear that I have the opportunity to mark four times at 2000 hertz. But what I need to worry about is that I, once I have two, two passing that they responded two times, then I know that that frequency has passed. So to be a passing though, I have to have both ears pass at all of those frequencies. When I have a refer, what that means is, is even if one ear at one frequency did not pass, that, that child has a refer status. So that needs to be continue on with your screening protocol. But you also may have to document that you could not screen that child. That could be a lack of cooperation from them. That could be the inability for them to be conditioned you know, to the response or the task at hand. So if you're, for whatever reason, if you're not able to, to complete the screening or conduct the screening, you need to report that as could not screen. As far as some tips and tricks with peer tone audiometry, as I mentioned, it, it is specific for three years and older. You have, do have some children that may have some development, cognitive, or motor challenges, and they may still be able to be screened with this method. You just have to make sure that they're, they can respond consistently. So if you know that they can respond consistently, consistently, then you certainly can use this method. If not, then that's when you want to move over to maybe an autoacoustic emission device, or you may have to refer to a professional if you don't have that. Another thing to remember is your placement of the audiometer in relation to the child. So when you're screening a child, you want to make sure that they can't see that audiometer. They're not seeing any of your hand movements. They're not seeing you present that tone. So, so make sure that their back is towards that audiometer. You can still see their responses, but just make sure that, that the view of the audiometer is hidden from the child. Another thing to keep in mind is to not give them any visual indicators. So sometimes people that are screening, you know, they might be, pre be presenting the tone and then looking at the child as they're presenting. And that can give the child a visual indicator that they're not necessarily hearing it, but they just know that you want them to respond to it. So keep those things, you know, be aware of those things um, that, that you're not causing any, any visual indicators to the child, but also with the mirror aspect again, that, you know, you're not, they can't see your hand movement from the mirrors. Also, so keep that in mind too. Like just remember your placement of the audiometer and, and make sure that, that the child is truly responding to the sound. Another thing to remember with your audiometry, your peer tone, is that you want to vary the presentation because you want to make sure that the child is not is responding to the sound and not just repeating the behavior. So if I'm presenting every two seconds, the child is just going to know, well, I just need to raise my hand every two seconds. So you want to vary that presentation from one second to three seconds, you know, that type of thing, so that you truly know that it is a response from them. Another thing to keep in mind is just that headphone placement, making sure that it's over the ears appropriately, that the red is on the right, the blue is on the left. The reason I say this again is because it can be very easy to switch those headphones around and not even be aware of it. So just be conscious of what, how I'm placing those headphones on and that I'm on the right here as well. When you do get a refer result with peer tone audiometry, the best thing is to change the screener, re-instruct, reposition those headphones, and re-screen within the same screening period. So immediately after the child refers, just go have someone else come over perform the screening on that child, or put them back in line and have them go and see another screener if, if possible. You know, but change that screener, always re-instruct, always reposition the headphones, just so that we can know it's truly a refer response. Also, it's important to know that you don't swap the headphones. So headphones are calibrated specifically to the audiometer that you have. So if you're thinking that maybe something's malfunctioning with your device, you can't just go and take headphones from another device and put it on the one that you have because they're all calibrated to that, to that device. So, so don't swap the headphones and think that that might solve the problem. Now moving over into OAE hearing screenings. So when you're conducting an OAE screening, it's best to review that probe tip, making sure nothing is blocking it. So if, if, if you're just starting your screening, make sure you have a new probe tip on, or you know, reviewing that and making sure that, that it's clean and clear. 
So that's the first thing that to, keep, to keep in mind, because when we're putting it in the ear, certainly wax or something can get into that probe. Then you're going to visually inspect the ear to determine the correct size of the ear tip. You're going to remind the child to not talk or move during the test because any noise can certainly um, impact that OAE result. So just making sure that they understand, just sit still and nice and quiet for me. A little movement isn't a huge issue, but you know, just be aware of those things. You're going to explain to the child what they're going to hear in the test process and what you're going to do. Uh, you're going to insert the probe. When you're inserting the probe, you're going to pull back and up on that ear. You take the, the ear tip, the probe, the ear tip on the probe, you insert it, and you kind of point it towards the nose, push it back a little bit, and then twist. That probe should be able to remain in the ear without you holding it. Um, so sometimes with, with uh, inserting the probe or selection of the ear tip, it may, you may not get it on the first shot. You might have to try it in your tip and you're like, well, this isn't staying in or I can't get it in the way that I need to. You might have to switch the, the ear tip and that, that's totally fine. Um, also, once I start that OAE test, the device is going to do an auto calibration before. So just remind the child you're gonna hear some, some beeps, does this auto calibration, but then the test will immediately progress and the OAE test results test can take seconds. So, you know, it can take anywhere between 8 to 16 seconds, just depending upon the protocol that you're using. Once you've completed one ear, then you want to switch over to the, to the other ear. We find that many people are, are not comfortable with the OAE testing, but really, once you get the hang of it, you're going to find out how simple and easy it is and how fast it is. So, but it is a trial and error. It does take a while for individuals to really kind of get accustomed to it. So, it might take you a quite a while to, to you know, just test on individuals before that screening actually occurs. We'd recommend, you know, you know take it home and, and test your friends and relatives, all of that. Just get comfortable with the device. With OAE screening results, there's a protocol set within the device. And based off of that protocol, you will get a pass or refer. So if the, if I, if I, if the responses are being uh, heard or being detected by that microphone as they should, um, then, and it meets my protocol criteria, then I will get a pass result on the screen. If for whatever reason um, it's not meeting that protocol, then I get a refer result on the screen. So that's why it's nice and easy. There's no, no guesswork. It gives you a pass or refer. But also with the OAE devices, you may get like a, a, a blocked or a noisy uh, response. Or, and so if, when you do get that, you might have to change the probe tip. You're gonna might have to uh, insert again. You might have to ch quiet the child down. Maybe the environment's noisy, but you can certainly test the child again if I'm getting that blocked or noisy, up to a point. Or if the child won't allow you to do the test. I mean, some children are very apprehensive of having a probe come into their, be placed into their ear. Um, so if you're just not able to, to do the test, then you would say could not screen as well. So um, as, as far as auto acoustic mix, emissions tips and tricks, um, the selection of that test procedure is for that zero to three years of age, but you may have to use it for older children, and you certainly can do that. Um, so if they're just not developmentally able to perform the pure tone, go to your OAE, re, uh, OAE test. An, an important part, I've mentioned this repeatedly, is the child just may not want that probe in their ears, but so it's, it's important to make sure you can ease their fear with the OAE. You know, taking that probe, you might want to, you know, show them how, have the ear tip on the probe, you know, uh, rub it against their hand so they can see there's no sharp edges. This isn't going to hurt. They're just going to be hearing some tones in their ears. So just trying to ease that for, for them. Another tip is with ear tip selection. And what, as I mentioned, this is a trial and error type of thing. You're just going to have to kind of do it multiple times to figure out what's going to be the best tip um, uh, that you're for your selection. So just try a few. If it's not progressing, try another one. Sometimes people think I just have to, I, I tend to have to always go down in size, but then there's other people that find I actually have to go up in size. So there's no magic um, recommendation that I can make for you. Just evaluate it for yourself. Another option that's available is using foam ear tips, and these can actually be squished down, placed into the ear, and then they expand, and this might be a better option for you. These are a little bit more expensive on ear tips, but that is a, an option so we can take some of the guesswork out of it. When you're placing that ear tip on the probe, you want to make sure that it's all the way down, because if, I, if it's not, then I can have some noisy um, noise be um, 
added to the test and then I'm not going to be able to proceed. I'll always get noisy measurements and that type of thing. So, um, Also keep in mind that ear tips are specific to the device that um, you know, going from one manufactured device to another manufacturer's device does not mean you can you can keep the same ear tips. So you might have to, you know, if you have multiple devices within your school, you might have to make sure you keep those ear tips separated. We, as I, as far as you know, getting ready for that screening, I mentioned having additional probe tips and ear tips on hand, making sure that you do have that on the on the day of the test. You do not want to to halt or stop your screening because a probe is blocked. And, as, and with OAEs, their rec the recommendation is, is that when you're, when you're doing OAEs, you don't want to do any more than two attempts. So if, if something happened in the environment, there was problems in the environment, there was some noise or there's some interference during the test that I think you think impacted, then certainly perform that OAE measurement again. But you're not going to want to perform four or five, six um, OAE measurements on the same year. Two is the max. All right, so this concludes uh, my presentation. I'm gonna now turn it over to Ryan again for the next step. Okay, thank you, Dr. Browning, for taking the time uh, to give us this important information. That was a great presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, we have received a few questions, and so we'd like to start going over the, the questions that we've received and, and get some answers there. Before I get into that, I just want to point out a couple of things to everyone that we have up on the screen now. Um, if you are in a position where you need to replace or, or purchase some new hearing screening equipment uh, through the end of June of this year, you can save $200 on the Mako AeroScan Plus DPOAE uh, with School Health. Um, reach out to us at School Health, visit us on schoolhealth.com um, to, uh, to get those savings. Uh, also, Dr. Browning had mentioned a couple of times uh, yearly calibrations. We do have the School Health Service Center. Uh, we've got expert technicians that are actually here with us at School Health. They can hand handle calibration. They can handle parts and repair for all of your hearing and screening equipment. Uh, you can learn more about the service center at schoolhealth.com forward slash service center. And let's jump right into the questions. Um, first question I've got uh, here, Dr. Browning, is how do you conduct an OAE screening on a student that has PE tubes? So with, when PE tubes are in place, um, because of the, the larger volume, because what's happening is I have to measure from the ear canal and then it's actually adding into that uh, middle ear space, so the device may not be able to proceed through the test because it has to have a closed volume, a certain volume. So many, I think all devices, all OAE devices that I know of will allow you to bypass a PE to or bypass that calibration that, that occurs. So I would just recommend you look into your manual and find out how you can do that because most, I think all devices allow you to be able to, to bypass that so that you can continue to perform a, a test even with someone with a PE to in place. Okay, thank you. I've got a, a couple of, of questions here about ear tips, and so I'm going to ask kind of two of them. Um, and I know that we just in the last couple of slides had talked about ear tips, but uh, got questions saying, can we use ear tips more than once? And then also, can you go over determining the size of an OAE tip? So with ear tips, um, specifically with the devices from Mako, they're a single-use ear tip. And I think most um, manufacturers are using those just because of cross-contamination. So we, we will strongly encourage you to use those ear tips a single time. Um, but you do have to look at the device that you have. Some of the older devices may have reusable ear tips, so you know, keep that in mind to, to really specify which device that you have and, and what you should recommend. As far as the selection of the ear tip, you know, like I said, it is really a trial and error. There is no quick tip I can give you. Um, you know, pulling back on that ear, looking at it, you know, making your selection, and and don't be afraid to to try a different ear tip. Um, otherwise, like we I mentioned too, is just the the foam ear tips. The foam ear tips allow you to kind of take a little bit of the guesswork out. Um, but when you're looking at the foam ear tips, sometimes they can be a little. Even though that you can squish them down, you may not be able to squish them down enough. So it really is best to evaluate all of your ear tip options and see what's going to work best for your for your school. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got a question here asking, can a student pass an OAE screening and still have hearing loss? Yeah, so with OAEs, that's one of the, 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 um, the items that I mentioned is that you, if you have a mild hearing loss, you still could pass an OAE test. But because we're using it on a population that we really have no other way of testing them, it really has become a practical testing tool within the schools. So if you ever have, if you, if you the, the school, you as a school nurse, parents have any concerns about their hearing, even if they got a passing result with, that, with your school, um, with your, within your screening process, always refer them to a professional. They can make that determination and diagnosis, and then you can have that on file. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, I've got a question here about Health Master electronic medical records, and I'll invite Mary Ellen from the school health team to weigh in on this if, if, if she can. Uh, any audiometer that is compatible with Health Master electronic medical records, um, is there a way that you can automatically enter the data for the hearing screening like you would for a vision screening using the spot vision screener? So uh, with regards to Health Masters and the audiometers, there's currently no way that you can uh, upload from the audiometry audiometer into the Health Masters software. Um, however, uh, MAKO does have a couple of devices, um, versions, where you can uh, print a PDF and then uh, you can take that PDF and upload it into your EMR system. So there is a way to take that information and get it into the system. Just takes a few more steps to do it. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I've got a, a question here from Monette uh, for Dr. Browning. Um, she says that if a student hears only at 40 dB or higher, then they have failed the hearing screening. And then she's got a, a second part of this. So she's asking um, if they only hear at 40 dB or, or higher, have they failed the hearing screener? And then she says that she's also been trained to never screen lower than 25 uh, dB. Um, should she be looking at screening at lower dBs like uh, 20 or 10? Um, so regarding the 40 dB, um, I would say that as far as I know, all states do not have a 40 dB as their screening level. So um, typically, or all, everything that I have seen is either 20 or 25. So yes, if a child is only responding at 40 dB, then they should be they should fail, and they should be going on for um, with continue on with your protocol that's in place, either referring, rescreening at a later date, referring them to a medical professional, whatever that may be. So, so 40, I've never seen 40 as a screening level. Um, as far as within your particular state, I would just look at your guidelines because you know those guidelines can change. I don't know when you are trained. Um, you may just review that you are, that it truly is 25 dB, and that's, that can be an acceptable level. Typically, I see 25 dB only at 500 hertz, though. So um, we would not, 20 and 25 is, your, is what I'm seeing as a screening level. If you, 10 is not. 10 is only used when you're doing your, um, checking your noise level. So when I'm selecting the location, that's when I may want to use, a, or I need to use a 10 dB level because I need to make sure that, that I can, that the, the student has the opportunity to hear at my screening level. And I can only do that is if I can truly hear at a level lower than that. So that's when you're going to want to use a, a 10 dB level. But I would really encourage you to look at your state guidelines and see what they say. And, and it's consistent to what you've been trained previously. And that 25 is the screening level. OK, thank you. A uh, question, uh, or perhaps a clarification, uh, when we're talking about hearing each tone. So the question says, did you say, do we need to have the student acknowledge hearing each tone two times for it to count as a pass? Can you clarify that for us, Dr. Browning? Yeah, so when you're looking at kind of just best practices and the guidelines in place from, from, from organizations, they all recommend that you get a confirmation of that, of that level. So yes, you should you should always get a confirmation of a minimum of two times. But no, and when you're presenting, you're going to present. If they respond two times immediately, great. Move on to the next frequency. 
Maybe they respond two times and then they don't respond on the third time. You, will, you want to make sure that you are getting that response two times, but you're not presenting a tone any more than four times. So if you're presenting that frequency at that level four times and they have not responded twice, then that frequency is a fail. Okay, thank you. And uh, Donna, in our audience, I'm seeing the question out here that you have asked. I think that, uh, that Dr. Browning just answered your question with, with this answer. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions about calibration, uh, who can calibrate Mako OAE devices and how do I get my device calibrated. I'll remind everyone to visit the School Health uh, Safety, uh, Service Center, uh, schoolhealth.com forward slash service center. We are equipped uh, with technicians to calibrate your equipment. Dr. Browning, did you have any comments that you wanted to add on calibration? No, just that it is really important from a manufacturer's perspective to make sure that device is meeting all standards that you do have it calibrated on a yearly basis. Okay, perfect, thank you. I'm seeing a, a few questions here about uh, logistics and we're short on time, so I'm just gonna jump in with, with a couple of these. Um, people asking about uh, the recorded version um, and about your certificates for attendance today. We will be sending a recording, uh, it's, a, it's a link to our YouTube site, out to each of you who have registered and you'll be able to review this presentation um, online at your leisure. Uh, like I said, we'll have that out within the next couple of days. That same email will contain a link to download your certificate of attendance. So keep your eyes on your email. Uh, we will be sending those, uh, both the link to the recorded presentation and for your certificate for attendance uh, out within the next couple of days. And with that, uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, as I mentioned, if we didn't get to your question, we will reach out to you directly with an answer. Uh, but I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Uh, we hope that you found the information useful and uh, a special thanks to you, uh, Dr. Browning, for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. I think this has been a great presentation and we really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, just to let everyone know, after you exit the webinar, you will see a survey window come up. We would ask that each of you take a, a few moments for this brief survey. I believe it's, it's just five questions, so you should be able to get through it pretty quickly. But take a few moments and, and tell us how we're doing. Let us know, you know what we can do better. Um, help us improve these presentations for you in the future. And with that, we'll say thank you and uh, sign off.